All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second episode of Accidental Origin. Hi, my name is Brendan, and I'm a writer. Uh, and this is the second episode of my weekly Twitch show uh, that I've just started. Um, so yeah, um, I've had a good week. I've been working on uh, show notes a bit. I did a couple of the exercises that I talked about last week, but we'll get to that more towards the end of the show. Um, and yeah, um, what's everyone up to? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Still, still working on my my intro uh, aspects, uh, but yeah. So that's me. That's what I've been up to. Uh, um, the first episode was I got a lot of positive response, so I'm pretty pretty stoked about that. Um, but I hope uh, we can keep that up and. You and I can can all learn uh, about writing. So, uh, yeah. So, episode two. Uh, the second episode of this, sh of this show is going to be about inspiration. As you can see on my wall there. I know it's inverted. Trust me, the room looks much better inverted. For whatever reason, it just it's just more solid. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be the second week of pretty much all theory. We're not going to do a ton of practical stuff. Uh, we should be going into practical stuff next week. I hope. I hope. Uh, though we might delve into that a little bit tonight. Uh, depending on how long the content I've planned uh, goes, I do have a backup lesson plan uh, for more more content uh, if need be. Uh, so hopefully we won't get to that, but we'll we'll see how we'll see how it goes uh, tonight. Um, so yeah, second uh, second disclaimer: channel art's pretty much ready to go. I'm just ironing out the last few details with Marcus. But uh, we should have that all up next week. I'm hoping. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. We'll, we'll gotta, gotta let everything fall into place, but, but that should be how it goes. Um, and then uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, oh yeah, um, and before I get to the last thing, uh, I'll do kind of a, a silly in, uh, a silly in, in unveiling uh, at the beginning of the show uh, with the logo and all that stuff when when I do get all those things ironed out. So that should be good. Look forward to that. It looks fantastic. Like really, really awesome. Uh, I'm super excited. I'm super excited. Uh, so yeah, the last thing I wanted to talk about in my disclaimer was that. Um, because this week we're going to be talking about inspiration, we're going to be talking about influences, um, I thought it was important to kind of bring up the idea of uh, what people call the classics. Um, now, the classics are those kind of, those, those must-see movies, defining movies of a generation. Um, you know, when, when we talk about film, we talk about things like Citizen Kane and uh, Birth of a Nation and uh, Howard Hughes and like a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, Pulp Fiction, those are all considered classic films. Uh, books are, are things like uh, Wuthering Heights and um, anything by... Um, uh, God, like James Joyce, all that stuff's considered the classics uh, for for reading, you know. Um, so the thing I have about that 
is that the classics, like, when, when, when you talk about things that people have to read and all that or, or have to experience, you kind of run into this, this problem of time, right? Not everyone has a f- tens of thousands of hours to t- sit down and watch movies from 50, 60 years ago. Um, just like just to sit down and do it so I'm not explaining this point very well but the 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 idea that I'm trying to to get across here is that uh, when, when we're talking about the classics and all those things there's hundreds of years of classics not necessarily in film films a bit of a younger medium but there's still over a hundred years of film stuff um, and no one's gonna have the time to to keep up with the currently re- current release content as well as the old content and all that stuff like it's just it's just too much material for any person to consume in their lifetime so um, in, in that vein uh, for the accidental origin experience uh, I'm totally not gonna have seen movies that people consider classic not at all, but I've seen a lot of old films, like, I'm a huge fan of Susan Cain, but unless you're a film major, you probably have never seen that movie, um, because it's from the 50s, like, there, there are, there is so much to experience, and there's no possible way for you to experience it all, so, yeah, um, we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep, uh, the idea of like, oh, why haven't you seen this thing to a minimum, uh, hopefully just cause you know, it's just, just too much, man. Just too much. Anyway, I have no idea if I explained that properly, but <laughs> I, I hope I got my idea across. So yeah, um, today's episode is going to be about inspiration and influence. Um, uh, so the reason why we're talking about these things is uh, last week we talked about creativity. Uh, so how to be creative, how to generate ideas, all that kind of stuff. And this week we're going to talk about um, inspiration, influence, in in sort uh, sort of the next step of that process. Like so, you go from being creative and promoting creative thought to having inspiration and being influenced in, in how you generate those thoughts and what thoughts you generate, uh, which then lead you to um, expanding on an idea, outlining an idea, uh, making a premise, a log line, all those things that, that lead you to creating a story. Um, so for, for me, this is the second step on the road uh, from nothing, the blank canvas, to a finished picture. Um, So yeah, Uh, as far as inspiration goes uh, and and creating an idea, uh, what we have, like, two ways that you can think about it, um, you either have an idea or you can generate an idea. Now, um, the exercises I was doing today uh, that I suggested last time are a way of generating an idea. Fortunately, having an idea is just sort of like it has to just it has to just come to you and we talked about last week about ways that you can make that easier like the ways that you can uh, speed up that process of, 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 of having it come to you but yeah it, it just has to come to you um, but yeah there's there's totally the idea of of generating an idea and and uh, last week I showed Seven Thanktum, the the random generator, and that's exactly what that's for. It's for uh, it's it's to use computerized randomization in order to spark some sort of flow, some sort of jumping off point, so you don't have to deal with that blank canvas. Because I because I know I know how how hard it can be to stare at that blank page and, and not know what to do. Like I get it, artists get it. Um, it, it's tough. It's it's totally tough. Um, but yeah, like generating an idea, jumping off points. Um, 
we, uh, you know, other ways are things like mind maps, uh, stuff like uh, writing prompts, always, always a good thing. Um, dream journals, regular journals, um, what if questions. Those are all good ways of generating ideas uh, for writing a story. So, after all that preamble, uh, I actually am going to read an excerpt from something that I wrote several years ago, my first real attempt at writing a novel, uh, because it specifically has to do with uh, the way in which we are inspired by our surroundings. At least, to me, that's, uh, that's what it's about. So yeah, I got my nice little excerpt here. So yeah, this is a this is from my novel fan fiction. Uh, it's called fan fiction. Uh, I never finished it, and I going back and reading it now. I feel like it's worth finishing. There's a lot of really good stuff there. It needs it needs work for sure. Uh, but that that's part of how you improve, right? Um, I'm, I'm a different writer now than I was two years ago. I'm a better writer. At least I, I, I think I'm a better writer. I hope I'm a better writer. <laughs> but yeah, um, that's 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 the that's part of the artist's journey, right? That constant climbing of the mountain. So, without further ado. <clears throat> fan fiction. The crowd moved with a purpose that Finn definitely did not share, which is why Aaron's brisk stride soon had her putting distance between them. Not that she noticed, engrossed in the email she was checking on her phone. Finn stopped as he looked at the, as he looked up at the complex they were headed towards. K Network's blue and white logo stood out against the polished glass and steel. It was even more distinct from the vibrant, vibrant greens of the greenery and the somber grays of the crowd. He closed his eyes and listened to the sounds of the city. Vehicles roared down the nearby expressway. The mass of people around him talked and laughed amongst themselves, passing around him as he stood. A giant video screen was mounted on the side of a squat building connecting two of the towers. New snippets, short interviews, and trailers played on loop and added a layer of cheerful chatter and dramatic music that was slightly drowned out by all the other sounds. He felt a shiver run through him. Pieces of ideas, sparked by the background noise, began to bounce around inside Finn's head. Plots exploded as the ideas collided like atoms in a reactor. The stories burned, trying to escape their fleshy prison into the world. Unconsciously, he reached out a hand in front of him, like he thought he could grasp all the possibilities floating in the air. What ifs, prickling his skin. Finn slowly opened his eyes. His gaze darted around the mob of people, making connections and pushing more possibilities into the mass of creativity swirling inside his brain. He knew that this happened to him with new experiences, especially in unfamiliar places. His eyes snapped bright. A man in a black suit and red tie walked by. The story flowed out. The man was a mob contract killer trying to leave the scene of his latest hit. A woman in a brown motorcycle jacket passed on his left. She was a stunt woman who would eventually fall in love with the Cheval. There were a good many more. Finn cataloged each person, each strange shadow, each reflection. He knew that he'd have to write them all down before the feelings escaped him. He might have a thing for plot and characters, but memory could be tricky and he didn't have the greatest control on his emotions. Even the slightest output could skew the perspective enough to ruin a good idea. It wasn't like he could see all the stories clearly, either. Quite a few were, there, were just out of reach, an itch you couldn't quite scratch. But they were there, and Finn had learned to recognize the feeling of his brain making connections, processing the new input and changing the output to compensate. Those moments were just as important as the fully fleshed out stories. He swore that he could feel his perspective changing as he watched, 
spinning old ideas into new, better ones, and noticing trends that could change the impact of others. Writing was all about emotions, and nuances were the key. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's an excerpt from my partial novel. And the reason I wanted to read you, to read this on, on Tuesday Day was A, uh, to show, to showcase a little bit of my work, uh, stuff that, that I've worked on in the past, stuff that I'm improving on, as well as to kind of show you what I mean by creativity and influence and how those things can, can help with your writing. Um, so yeah, uh, I talk a lot about, about that where, where, you know, when I walk down the street, I, I make up, I make up scenarios of what, who people are and what they're doing and why they're doing it. And, uh, you know, what, what's, what's their story? Um, that guy sitting on the bus uh, across from you uh, is, I don't know, making this up on the fly, is um, on the run from uh, government persecution and is, is hiding out in Canada legally in order to uh, find some sort of piece of evidence in order to clear his name. I mean, that's a little hokey and a little maybe stereotypical, but those are the kinds of things I think about when, when, I, when I go places, right? You know, that person on the street has, has a story, has a life. They came from somewhere. They have influences. They have people they love. They have people they hate. Who are those people? Why do those people matter? How, how does that affect his story? Um, right? So those are all things that, that I think about when, when I'm trying to come up with an idea. And, and, and the best ones that, of those that I get when I'm walking down the street and all that, I save for later, like I said last week. Write as much as you can down because it'll come in handy later on, for sure. Um, like there's always there's always something for that so yeah ideas and inspiration uh, I've been this week I reread uh, Brick by Brick by Steve McCraney uh, as part of the book club which I, uh, I'll talk about at the end but that book um, contains um, so much of what I was trying to do with this episode. I mean, I, I, I had all these points and I read the book and I was like, oh, this essay is this point and this essay is that point and, and this essay is this point. So obviously, in, in some sense, I'm on the right page, right? Like, I, I'm saying the things that other creators are saying because you know when, when when that many people are saying it that means that someone's on the right track somewhere right um, there's like I was saying last week and I need to stop referring to last week because who knows if you even watched last week but uh, There's artists say the same things. They just say them in different ways, and that's it, it, that's one hundred percent what I'm finding with this work with do, with doing accidental origin is like I have all these thoughts about what I think things are, and and it's awesome to see them confirmed by people who I respect and, and who know a lot more than I do about about these topics. So yeah, uh, so I'm gonna present uh, a little bit of um, what's going on in Brick by Brick, because uh, I think it's important. Uh, 
Uh, and I think that it really hits nail on the head for what I'm doing with inspiration this week. Uh, so number one, uh, or the, the first part I wanted to talk about, go to my main screen here, whoops, got one. And this is off, uh, this is off Stephen McCrammy's website. And I, and I won't, I won't go through the entire comic. I think you should all read them yourselves, but I just wanted to have something kind of up to show, uh, as I went through it. So taste is your teacher. Taste is your teacher is a comic essay talking about, um, how we have to immerse ourselves in people who do what we do, you know? As a writer, I study other writers. I study people who have written for a long time. I study people who have written for a short time. I immerse myself in writing and writers. An artist would study the master, study Da Vinci, study Michelangelo, study all these people who came before you and, and have had impact. And as you do that, and as you study them, you can, you can learn the the tools that you need to be the type of artist you want to be, you might not know them by the same names as the, as the masters knew them, but you'll still know them on a certain level, right? Like, you learn perspective by looking at how people do perspective. You learn lines and shape and form and value by watching people who know about those things and, and studying how they do them, right? So that's, that's the biggest part of becoming inspired. You got, you got to go out and, and find people who are inspiring, who do cool things that you can learn from. And so as you do this, you're going to find that your art is not great. It's not. The more you have a taste for great art, the less that you're going to think that your art is great. And that's true. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the thing that, that Steven talks about and that I am, like this, this specific comic, this essay, has inspired me for years upon years before I even found who re rediscovered who Stephen McCraney was I had had this comic on my desk for for ages and basically the idea of be friends with failure is your art is not great compared to those masters but those masters have probably failed more times than you've even tried uh, and I said this last week and, I, and I'll say it again a thousand times but Failure is the first step of learning. Um, and that's what this talks about. Those, those masters have failed more times than, than the beginners even tried. So you can't hold yourself to the same standards as them. That's not to say that aesthetically you can't strive to be like them. That's just saying that until you've put in the time, you can't really compare yourself to those people. Just like you can't compare a baby learning to talk to a fully grown adult. You don't tell a baby it sucks because it can't talk yet, it's learning. You're, you're an art baby. You're learning. There's a process. There's a whole set of things involved that, that you need to improve on. So be friends with failure. Make him your buddy. Learn. Be better. Look at those great artists. Be inspired. Learn things. You'll be better for it.
So, on that note, the third part of uh, Brick by Brick that I wanted to talk about today is that, well, this is the panel I want, is the art of stealing. In the essay, uh, the essay here is entitled Practice Does Not Make Perfect. But I wanted to talk about a specific aspect of that. Um, Stephen's broader point is that uh, practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Right? So when we talk about that, that, that means if you have bad habits, they're going to be ingrained in you if you practice them. And, and that's totally true because, oh my god, do I have bad habits with stuff. Um, yeah, man, do I have bad habits. <laughs> um, but the important thing that you, that you got to take out of this essay is the art of stealing. That sounds really weird. Brendan, why, why the art of stealing? We don't want to steal. We want to be original. We want to be creative. We want to be all these things. And it's like, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. I totally get that. Um, but as the great Pablo Picasso once said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And what he means by that is that, I keep saying that, what he means is that we can imitate as much as we want. And it'll be nothing more than a replication, a duplication. A, 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 a copy of what someone else has done. When you steal, that's a deliberate intent in order to learn. Like, you're making a deliberate intention to do a study. To, to see why someone did something. What's the formula for how they got there? You know? An imitation is... It, it, you'll, you'll, you'll learn how to do... You'll learn how to imitate. But you won't learn how the whole thing is, is formulated. How it's all put together. When you, when you study a painting and, and you do a, a copy of a painting, like, you, you don't, if you're just doing the copy, you just make it look the same. Or you're not learning the br brush strokes. You're not learning what, like, why, why did he do a perspective this way? Why did he do it that way? Um, how, how can I do those things and how can that help inform my own style? Right? So... That's what I mean when I talk about, about stealing. The difference of imitation versus inspiration. You know? Like... These people are awesome and we can learn so much from them, but you gotta learn from them in the right ways. And, and I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitch with, with artists talking about, oh, I don't like it when people copy me, or I love it when people copy me, and all this stuff, and I think both perspectives are, are valid, um, but at the same time, it, 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 it depends on how they're learning when they copy you, right? And... and this is a big part of being a writer, especially, though we look at it a little bit of a different way. The way that I look at it 
is that I look at it in terms of uh, how do people construct story? What are genre tropes? What are interesting ways that they've done uh, that type of setting? Because I'm going to say it now, and, and I'm probably going to be flamed for saying it, but there's no such thing as an original idea. Everything good has already been thought of. But what there is, is there's an original presentation of an unoriginal idea. Which is not the same thing, but you can definitely do that. And the way that we do that is by gathering all these little pieces from other things and, and building them together to create a new thing. And that goes directly back into my, into my next point, which is Stephen, the master that he is, or the master that I think he is, talks specifically about this, and is that there, there are three steps to imitation, three ways to imitate. The first way is called the naturalist. Now, the naturalist, uh, get this thing here, the naturalist goes out and sees the beauty in its, in its habitat. And you record its movement and you, you have to you kinda sit there and create a hypothesis that accounts for what you're seeing. You gotta look for patterns. You gotta observe. You gotta correlate. You gotta connect those dots that have never been connected before. Thinking outside the box. And, and I see you talking about that there, Baseman. Like, yeah, and, and I and I and I honestly believe that. But that doesn't mean that what you do can't be interesting. It just means that you have to know that your stuff's gonna be compared to everyone else's stuff. I mean, I don't think I've had a conversation about writing where someone, either me or whoever I was talking to, didn't say, oh, that kind of sounds like this. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, it kind of does. Um, in fact, I mean, when you're doing television and film pitches, and this is stuff I learned in school, when you're doing television and film pitches, um, they still do it now in Hollywood a lot, though not as much, I think, as they used to. But it's kind of this idea of it's, it's X meets Y with this twist. So it's like, it's Jaws meets Twister. That's what Sharknado is, right? Like, that's the way that Hollywood kind of does it. Like, or at least the way that they used to do it a lot. You know, that's how you have to present your thing. So, you know, when I was working on my show, it was like, uh, it's uh, Game of Thrones meets Boardwalk Empire. Right? Like, that's the way that, we, that, that those creative types think about these things. So it's okay that there's no original ideas. It's just you, you kind of have to get out of there and, and, like, see where your influences are and see what, what other people are doing. Oh, yeah. And, and there's totally something to be said about doing research. That being said, um, I don't do a ton of research on specific topics when... When I do it, because I, I find I get too influenced by other things. Um, but I will do some research on, on a basic level. Um, right. There, there, there's, there's, there's a happy medium. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And by the way, Derek. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. This is basically my podcast. Um, that's pretty much the style I was going for here. Um, and thanks for the host. So yeah, first step, the naturalist. The second step, the scientist. Once you have a hypothesis, you test it. You fail. You learn. You sit down and you evaluate why it did or didn't work. Because it's one thing to fail, but the important learning step is the second step after failing is the first step of learning. The second step is figuring out why you failed. Right? Because 
it's it's that process that makes you better. It's that constant self study that makes you better. And and as much as I don't like the peer reviewing process, science is very much that way where anything you publish has to be reviewed by several other people and validated. Right? So if you failed, it has to be validated by other people to show that you actually made proper conclusions. That you actually learned something. And I don't really agree with the peer review process in, in, in the total of academics, but there are certain situations where it certainly works. Um, but that's a whole other, other thing. And uh, I will talk about that ad nauseum on a, on a not on, the, on stream. <laughs> Um, or it's more relevant, but yeah, there's certainly something to be said. Then number three is the DJ. And this is the part that I like and the part that I really am in tune with, I think, uh, play with what you discover when you make your conclusions about why you fail or didn't fail, play with it. Try things. Try new things. If, if something failed and you figure out, well, oh, um, my character was weak. Well, what character would work? Would this character work? Would, this, would that type of character work? Would um, a gender swap work? Like, once you figure it out, play with it. Like, determine where, where you can try things and, and try lots of things. Because again, even if you fail, learn something from it, right? Um, and, and, and that's the kind of thing, right? And um, Steven here talks about uh, he likes drawing his characters using other artists' styles because it, it, it forces you to think about certain aspects and remix them, put them out in a different way. And I hadn't thought about it before right now, but um, basically what he's saying is make fan art. <laughs> Draw someone else's character in your own style. Draw lots of other characters in your own style. See how your style adapts to those things. See, study how they, why they made certain aesthetic decisions. Why, you, why they constructed a story in a certain way. Right? Those are things you can you can learn, and as much as I, I I laugh about it and all that, like oh I got my start in fan fiction, how embarrassing! There is a certain world in fan fiction that's really good at stuff like this, where they're not afraid to try weird plots and 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 messed up characters and situations that would never logically occur just to see what would happen. And that's why I still read fan fiction to a certain extent. It's because of that thing. Right? So there's a whole world of, of, of stuff that you can experience and, and, and play with. So do it. Fail. Failure is the first step of learning. Ask questions. Observe the world around you. You will be a better artist, a better writer for it. So on that note, we're going to have fun time. I'm going to open up another window here. I have a whole, I have a whole bunch of, of, of places to go to. We're going to talk about a little bit here. So I'm going to open up the first couple. First two are art places. Here. So this is ArtStation, and I know people who follow Derek's stream know ArtStation. I certainly know ArtStation. ArtStation is a place for artist portfolios. You can just spend time learning, studying, immerse yourself. 
Figure out why, why are these images so cool? What works? What doesn't work? How could you improve on it? How could you make your own style better because of something that they're doing? Um, are they using uh, a certain brush? Are they using a certain uh, lighting? Are they using whatever, right? Like those are all things that you can think about. And again, DeviantArt, the big one. Uh, been around a long time. Uh, but there's plenty of stuff on here that's the same way, though I think uh, DeviantArt is a little bit uh, more abstract at times. But that's okay. Abstract is good. Um, I talked about this a little bit in my prep stream uh, when I was doing some tests and stuff earlier, but uh, it's important to be multidisciplinary, or at least to study multiple disciplines. You don't have to be good at them, but, but being able to see them... Um, really shows like it can influence your work heavily right um knowing how architecture works can make you a good painter because you can draw you can paint backgrounds really really well because all your buildings will look fantastic studying sculpture changes how your lines are and, and all that stuff um for me, I study fan fiction. I read comics. I watch movies. I read scripts. I read plays. I look at art. I study art. I I I, don't, I spend most of my time with art streamers, not writers, writing streamers. Because I, I I there's there's aspects of the process that are the same, and there are aspects that are completely different. Like this time a year ago, I would not know anything about value. And the way that color works and how color values work, I mean, I'm pretty much just repeating the same thing, but like there are so much you can learn about how that applies to other things. So now I think about it in ways of writing, right? Like how can I add those, those, those broad colors and then give them this nice accent when it comes to my writing? When I construct a paragraph, when I construct a setting, what draws the eye when I describe the setting? Because those are the details that are important. Those ones that draw the eye. Right? I mean, I'm a visual writer. I'm a visual storyteller. Like, that's what I'm good at. So, and well, I mean, that's what I studied. So I think, I think very heavily in terms of visuals and in terms of film shots and like all that kind of stuff. But there's there's aspects of those things that, that can really help influence your writing, help influence your art. So then I'm going to pop up some more stuff here. Fanfiction.net, the kind of the granddaddy of fanfiction. Um, I used to be on here a lot. I don't come on here nearly as much. Um, but I used to, I used to a lot. Um, I actually kind of like this other site a little bit better because it's a little bit laxer on its, uh, content rules, which I prefer. I prefer having a little bit less censorship. Also, I like reading mature things. That's just personal preference. I'm an adult. I can make those decisions. <laughs> but yeah, um, this is just a whole different type of community. But they both do a lot of similar things. Also, being able to find things with tags and all that is really cool uh, for fan fiction. Uh, it makes things a little bit different. Uh, you can stumble on a lot of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily stumble on just because it has related things to other stuff you liked. Um, so yeah, uh, then there's uh, places like Wattpad, uh, that mobile writing place. I haven't been on there yet. I know some people who do. Uh, it seems interesting. It seems a lot like these kind of places. You can learn a lot. You can go to San Sanctum. You can go to the library. Go to the library, choose a random section, pick something up. Read it. Don't read all of it. Just read some of it. Expand yourself. Right? So then, as part of that, I'm going to talk about uh, something Stephen talked, but I don't have a panel over this one, but what's called artistic lineage. And artistic lineage is looking at the people who influenced you and then look at the people who influenced them 
And then if you can still go further back, the people that influence them. You're being influenced. You're being inspired by certain people who are then, who are influenced and, and inspired by other people. And, and you can go back and you can look at those other people and say, oh, well, this is what they took from that. Here's what I could take from that. And do a wholly different thing with the same source, with the same, with, with a similar structure, with a similar whatever. Like, there, there are lots of parts of that. Um, and, and I see that all the time because, like, uh, the next segment of the stream, like, once I'm kind of done this point and there's a few questions in the chat that I'm going to get to in a minute, um, uh, I'm going to talk about my influences or, like, five of my influences. And my influ like, there are people that I'm super inspired by that... Uh, that influence my influences. Right? Like, that sounds really weird and, and topsy-turvy, but there's totally that. Where you, there's, there's so much you can learn. And, and that's why, like, art teachers... Uh, and I did study a bit of fine art and, and architecture and art history and all that uh, as, part of film as part of the film classes I had to take. So I do know a little bit about this, but not so much about more, like, I know more about art history than I know about, like, technique. Um, well, maybe not anymore, but half a dozen of one, six of the other, you know, whatever. But uh, that's why it's important to look at the old masters. And I know at the beginning of the show, I kind of had this speech about, like, there's not enough time to experience all the classics, and there isn't. But focus browsing of those things can be really, really beneficial for you. I love Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane is a fantastic film. It is sometimes considered the best film of all time. Um, almost nobody I've ever met has actually seen it, even people who grew up in that era. Um... And that's unfortunate, but at the same time, that's, that's the way it is, right? Like, that's why the, saying things like, oh, it's a classic, it's hard, it's a modern classic, um, all that stuff. But there's tons of things that I think are classic, which, which you haven't experienced either. Like, I don't know, like Osama Tetsuka, or... Yoshi, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, who I'm going to talk about later, and, and like all this stuff. Um, so yeah, that's influences. That's inspiration. These are the people you look up towards. These are the people you can learn from. So yeah, that's all I got for part one, uh, which is good because we're about an hour in, which is kind of where I wanted this to be. Uh, so Baseman's been asking me some questions, so I'm going to answer those. Um... He says, uh, this really makes me think about whether or not I worked enough on my manuscript, as I only had six months to write it. And the answer is, I don't know. But that being said, the amount of time it takes is not an indicator of how good or bad something is. I've worked on stuff for months, and it's not nearly as good as stuff I worked on for six weeks. The strength of your idea and the strength of your project is not made or break does is not make or break by the amount of time spent on it. What matters is the the quality of the idea and the quality of time spent on it. Right? I mean, uh, a couple weeks ago when Derek restarted Leviosa, um, which was an image he was working on. Uh, he spent a solid week doing nothing but focus streams and worked on it three, four hours a day for every day. And in that week, he had a substantially more solid image than the one that he spent, uh, like almost a month and a half on previous to that. So I'll reiterate. 
It's not about the amount of time you spent. It's about the quality of the time you spent. And I actually saw a thing about the Geek & Sundry book publishing contest earlier today. I have not looked at it. Um, it depends when the due dates are because I don't know if I have anything that's like really ready yet. Like a, a substantial enough draft to, to be ready for submission. But I will certainly take a look at it. Because, you know, opportunities are opportunities. And if you don't, if you don't take the time to even look, you, you may never know, right? So yeah, I'm going to take a uh, five minute break right about here and come back. Well, yeah, about five minutes. Uh, I'm going to come back around eight o'clock and uh, we're going to start part two and it's going to be over on the couch, uh, which should be fun. Uh, I might have to do some audio fandangling because uh, I'm not entirely sure if my mic's going to pick me up. Which I should have tested this morning, but I kind of forgot. So, oops. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. If not, I'll just come back to the desk and we can talk about it here. So yeah, go into a break. There's my mouse. There's my mouse. Do 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 breaks. <laughs> 